the Ottawa River Musky Factory. Hi again and welcome to this time the Musky Monday Seminar Series Week 17. Wow, it's amazing how time flies. This week's topic, how to get the most out of your guide and how your guide gets the most out of you in a boat. So we're basically talking about musky efficiency and motivation and a whole lot of things that have to do with how to catch more muskies. Um, today, to go through that journey, who better than outdoor writer and fellow Shimano pro team staff member, Muskie Factory Baits pro team staff member, um, Wally Robbins. Wally has fished <clears throat> with freshwater and saltwater guides in so many places. And he's written a lot of articles on fish. He's a multi-species guy. He's written a lot of articles on muskies, as you know. Um, and somebody who I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, of working with. He's also written a bunch of articles on guides and how to how to maximize your time with that uh, with them. So who better to have on this topic today than my great friend Wally Robbins and fifth year guide for the Ottawa River Muskie Factory, Mike Kadura. Um, Mike is an amazing guide who's gone from zero to sixty as a guide in in five years. He's a sponge. He catches a ton of fish. Um, and we're going to see things through his eyes as a guide and his learning curve and what he does to uh, to help his guests, sometimes less experienced guests, um, get over the hump of catching fish, sealing the deal at the side of the boat, that sort of thing. So that's our show for today. And after that, um, ask the biologist. <clears throat> with Dr. Sean Landsman, as usual. This week's topic, uh, a, a really big topic. It's how does climate change affect muskies? Uh, muskies already and muskies going forward maybe. So uh, a big, broad, controversial topic with uh, a, a lot of different points of view. So I look forward to viewer feedback tonight. Ask your questions on this one. Um, you know, we're science-based. Musky fishing is all about science and behavior. Uh, management of musky resources is all science-based. And so we'll talk about climate change and its effect on muskies tonight. Um, Got to get our thank yous out of the way at the start of the show, because as you know, we always talk uh, too long on muskies, or sometimes too long. So um, thanks to you. The audience, as usual, question and for and answer format. That's how we're going to do this show with Mike and Wally and get two different answers tonight. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Uh, we're going to take more questions than usual. So please um, send your questions in. We'll feature more of your uh, uh, more of the information that you want. Ask whoever you want. Ask about all of us. We'll sort it out from there. Um, thanks to Mike Spratt, who's in his basement, as always, making baits while he watches this show. Busy time of year. Um, Lisa and Mike, I usually bring them out at this time, but you're going to see both of them in the show in a couple minutes. I want to throw a big shout out to uh, Musky Factory, Ottawa River Musky Factory guide, Anthony Sapiano. Anthony is the principal of Ottawa River Musky Fish School, which we're doing in conjunction with the Dover Court Community Center this year. Announced it two weeks ago on here. Then this evil COVID wave hit like the day after. It's already over half sold out. If you know a child or a friend's child who wants to go to summer camp for a week uh, and learn about fishing, learn about being good stewards of the environment, uh, Lisa's got the official poster for the camp up out of Dover Court Community Center. I think she'll have a link up there for you to go to after that. We always thank Shimano on this show. Big part of my fishing world. Big part of Wally's fishing world. 100 years in Shimano. Um, can't say enough good things. So proud to be on that team. Andre Lalone, uh, best boat guy I've ever had. Crest liner boats, Mercury Motors. I can't wait to take my new boat out next week with my new Mercury 150 on it. Got to break it in, get it ready for the season. But thanks, Andre, in advance. Um, Suik, Mike Suik here last week. Uh, 
killer good information on jerk baits, on soft plastics. Um, Brent Bochak, again, thanks for that. And Lisa as well. First, first female pro staffer um, for uh, SUIC in the history of SUIC. Sale as usual. And Muskies Canada, we got some great upper, really interesting upper uh, Muskies Canada news. Um, the Odyssey total was, I think, a hair under $50,000. Just unbelievable. A lot of that going to uh, directly into research, um, a lot into the club to do so much good. Um, fantastic. What a successful event. Uh, Jamie Sebastian from the Upper Ottawa Valley chapter of Muskies Canada. If you don't know about that group, um, they're a, a brother group to the Ottawa chapter, the biggest chapter in all of Muskies Canada. Um, Jamie's got an event going on from June 26th to July 3rd. Now may still be a COVID period. We're all hoping it's not. But this is a really neat uh, event that takes COVID uh, into consideration for all of us. It's also the first ever online and week long event in the history of Muskies Canada. So, you know, every chapter, the Ottawa chapter alone has four outings that you can participate in, um, get great feedback from everybody, uh, share and learn together, hang out with a great bunch of guys. This is one in the upper Valley. This is another bonus one. Um, fantastic. Great on, great on you, um, Jamie. And a week-long event. You know, the fish that are going to come out of this uh, are going to be crazy. So can't wait to see that uh, see that board and be part of this tournament. Um, great work. So from Muskies Canada on to the Muskie Symposium. Um, wow, we've been talking about the Muskie Symposium um, and the Odyssey for months on here. The Odyssey was two weeks ago, the Symposium this past weekend. It's amazing in life when things exceed your expectations. And both of those events uh, just exceeded my personal expectations. And I think, um, amazingly, the expectations of the whole musky world. And what everybody's discovered is we, we've come together in different groups, Muskies Canada and Muskie Trader, separate groups. Um, the Muskie Symposium or the Musk and the Muskie Trader Symposium guys, different group. They raise, they do so much good with the money that they raise in so many different directions. And this time, um, it was bait makers in the Muskie world and people who love Muskies and people who fish for Muskies, people who support Muskies, supporting the cause uh, ourselves through Muskie Trader. Uh, Muskie Trader. So, um, Danny Colley and your team. Um, just five friggin' star. Lisa Goodyear, who put so much effort into producing that and making it just another event that you look back at and go, the quality of the productions that are coming out from people in their basements, you know, built on passion um, and showing sh the teaching and the knowledge that came out of that, as well as the, mo uh, as well as the money. Um, it's changing times in the musky world. We're going to raise a lot of money in the future. We're going to drive a lot of musky re research. And, you know, that's through Sean and Cook Labs. And the first people, um, first, I'll just, I just got to say the proceeds out of that event went to almost half to Cook Labs, over 12,000 bucks already um, to support Stephen and Sean and Jordana Burt, Dr. Stephen Cook, Dr. Sean Landsman, and, and PhD student Jor Jordana Bergman. Um, they're, they all did presentations. They're all on the Musky Factory bait site um, just from this past weekend live. Mind blowing. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, just inspiring uh, um, as well. So, the knowledge that came out of that from them, uh, um, incredible. Thank you guys. Um, Mike Parker, my brother bait maker from Handlebars, an awesome bait company. Um, and more than that, Mike Parker is just an amazing human being. Um, he gives so much of his time and so much of his money and so much effort towards the muskie fishery. And he gave an unbelievable presentation on the telemetry study tracking 143 uh, muskies on Lake St. Clair, including one that swam a thousand kilometers twice in two different years. So, you know, if you want to learn about muskies, Go look at that stuff. And then Brent Bochak was out again. Brent's presentations get better. I hang out with Brent a lot, my Suic brother. Better and better. Go watch those. Um, you know, absolutely fantastic stuff um, all weekend long. So, And then the killer of that, Doug Wagner, 
um, the best electronics presentation I have seen. So, Musky Trader, you did something really, really good. Thank you on behalf of my person and every everybody who watches this and cares about muskies. You know, you you really helped drive research and and uh, did it in a real way. So that was a long ramble. Sorry about that. Just thought it was so cool, so so cool, and sets the stage for a really good future. Um, looking at the future. Musky Mondays are continuing to go next week. Hedrick doesn't know it yet, but he said he'd be on the show. And he said it through Sean. And so I have a teacher's teacher on here. Hedrick Wachalka is one of the smartest behavioralists I know. And he learned about muskies by driving research in the 90s and up to the modern day. But by standing on top of bridges and watching muskies for long periods of time. Who does that? Hedrick does that. Um, mapping out weed beds. He's a pioneer. He's Canada's greatest urban musky fisherman of all time. I'm going to ask him if he's got a thousand muskies fishing off the shore in downtown Ottawa. Your an His answer might blow you away. So uh, tune in next week. Sean's going to join us for that whole show as well. Um, the week after that, Doug Wagner is here on this show. Uh, we're going to talk electronics. We're going to talk about the evolution of the Green Bay fishery. Um, and we're just going to talk to one of the smartest young voices in the muskie world on all levels. That guy has packed a lifetime of muskie experience and guiding experience, multi-species, uh, Lake of the Woods, Green Bay. He is so hardcore. And, and, you know, when we did the interview this last week for him, he got off the water from one charter. He did an interview with us and he went right back out on the water for another charter for for walleye. So, uh, great stuff coming up ask the biologist with dr sean landsman so grateful dr sean is here every week i am so much smarter for your presence this is a big topic i just got the email on this an hour ago before i was getting in the shower and and you know the it's a controversial topic for a lot of people um you know get over it look at the science let let the stats let the science drive where you go with this um that's my attitude you're free to have your own attitude sean um can't wait to hear what you have to say to us all this evening so without further ado as always the man, the man who i stood up for at the odyssey when when ryan pickering said he had I missed it. the greatest the greatest hair in muskie <laughs> canada i said no it's right there it's the Wolfman, the Wolfman Jack. You are a young Wolfman Jack right there. So happy to have you as usual, Wolfman. Well, when I was when I was still a wee little fetus inside my mom, the uh, ultrasound technician said, you got some kind of gorilla growing in there or something? Because I had hair like crazy even when I was in the womb. So yeah, it's sort of been my, I guess my calling card. But uh, wow. anyway, if anyone wants some, I got plenty. Which I'll send you some in the mail, and you can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> Looks good <laughs> on you here, here on Musky Mondays. We're all jealous. Um, We're all jealous. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I think I think this this topic. Um, I, I hope that people listening keep an open mind. Uh, you know, I think this is the kind of the elephant in the room. I mean, last week we talked about low water levels, and and we over the weekend, you know, we spent a lot of time and on the Musky Trader. Uh, uh, some musky symposium there talking about habitat. Uh, when I did my little co talk there with Jordana, uh, Jordana Bergman, and you know, it's when you talk about habitat and low water, I mean, you know, the kind of thing that that is in the background these days a lot, uh, is, is climate change. And you know, I, I think that there's often it's kind of a, a, a NIMBY thing, right? Not in my backyard, you know, we don't really think about it too much because we don't really see it, but actually. The more I talk to old timer anglers, the more I hear interesting observations of changes in things in the environment, particularly weather patterns over time, over someone's lifetime, that, um, that mirror what's shown in the literature, what's shown in, in, uh, uh, by, by scientific studies. So, you know, I, I, I thought it, it would be apropos to talk about climate change in the context of muskies. So, I mean, I'm only going to talk for 10, 15 minutes. And, 
you know, that it's not enough to do this whole topic justice. But um, I, you know, would like to kind of get 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 us talking a little bit and, and show you some examples of how a, a changing climate may end up really having some kind of a tangible impact on on muskies. So, uh, Lisa, if you want to go ahead and throw up my my presentation here, we can get started. All right. So, what are two things uh, that muskies re require? And uh, two of the things that that come to my mind when I think about requirements for muskies and and muskie populations is they need to have the appropriate spawning habitat and they need to have the appropriate nursery habitat. So, habitat being the umbrella there, uh, and they need to have food. Okay, if they don't have spawning and nursery habitat and they don't have food sources, we got problems. So what happens if those two things are lost or at least in short supply? So if we've got loss of spawning habitat, well, if we have a loss of spawning habitat and for some reason they're spawning over um, inappropriate uh, substrates or, or other habitat, then you may have a situation where the eggs don't hatch uh, or if they if they do hatch, something's, you know, something's wrong at the at that fry stage, and you may end up having reproductive failure. If that is allowed to continue for a long enough period of time, if you don't have successful reproduction, you're going to have a population decline. It's, it's pretty simple math. Uh, if you've got a loss of nursery habitat, right, this is nur nursery habitat being the habitat that juveniles need, you then may have a situation where you have lots of YOY or young of year mortality. If you've got a lot of that young of your mortality, that means you've got fewer little babies that are going to grow into adults. And we call that term recruitment, when, an, when a baby re recruits to the adult life stage. If you don't have as many adults, you have fewer spawners. If you have fewer spawners, you may see a population decline uh, as a result of that. Okay, so those are two examples in the habitat realm. Then on the on the food side, if you have a loss of prey items, and we'll talk about one in particular, one particular prey item that has been linked to larger, to, to water bodies that have larger muskies. But if you have a loss of prey items, you may result in smaller muskies or the muskies may switch to other prey. Uh, if you've got smaller muskies, you've got sad anglers. And if you're another fish species, you got some very worried other fish species. So uh, it's a bit cheeky there at the end, but but regardless, uh, we, you know there is a clear link between uh, certain fish species and the size of muskies, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail coming up here. And I've actually already talked about it in a prior Ask the Biologist um, state um, talk. So yeah, we we really can't ignore climate change. Uh, it's a it's a very measurable threat. Um, we have long term historical records that that show. A, a very quickly changing climate that uh, that is that is very well correlated with uh, with with human disturbance and industrialization. Um, we also have to remember that climate is the average weather, right? So weather is noisy from one day to another, uh, even from one year to another. Weather patterns are noisy. You might have really high temperatures one day and really low temperatures the next day, or above average temperatures one year and the next year it's below average temperatures. But you really need to think about climate as the long-term trend in weather. So if you're familiar with the stock market, you know, my father always told me, get into the stock market as quickly as you can uh, and uh, you know, just ride the waves because the stock market goes up and down, up and down. But over time, and he used to trade stock, trade stock options on the Chicago Board of Trade, over time you start to see that trend going up and up and up. So your, your money uh, theoretically increases in value over time. And so it's that long-term trend that we're interested in. And I think the thing, the big thing for me when I think about climate change and, uh, and muskies in particular, I think of volatility in weather patterns and temperature extremes, particularly warm temperatures, especially during the summer. We'll talk a little bit about how those things may affect muskies. So let's first talk about volatile weather. So there's really two key periods for muskies, especially with regards to uh, spawning and nursery habitat or survival of, of young. You've got what happens in the winter and then you've got what happens in the spring. And so what happens in the winter could be one of two scenarios in, in, this, in this region. 
uh, in our temperate latitudes. Lots of snow, okay, or little snow. If we've got lots of snow, we then have lots of runoff in the spring, um, and we we have high water. And that sort of assumes that like you've got um, you've got the right kind of warming conditions. If you've got really prolonged, very, very gradual warm warming conditions, you may actually not have a ton of runoff because that and, and like and pulses and in, in water levels. Um, because that 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 runoff is allowed to occur over a long period of time, and you don't get those uh, those seasonal floods, which which we actually need and muskies need, because we need to have these wetlands and marshes flooded. Uh, if we've got little snow, then we have little may have little runoff in the spring, and that results in in low water. In the spring itself, so right around this time. If we have low amounts of rain, that translates to low water levels. And these are pictures that I think John may have shared last week um, with me, and I think I put them up on my Ask the Biology, Biologist segment. But this, these are marshes in uh, along the Ottawa River. And uh, you know these should be pretty well full of water right now. And uh, they're they're pretty they're pretty low for this time of year. So you know, fingers crossed, we actually see, uh, some additional rain in the coming weeks as those muskies start to get into, into full-on spawning mode. So high water. At its worst, high water can displace fish. It can also damage habitat. So something called scouring, where it, you've got really high, say, in a, in a river system, high flow events that literally just scrape the bottom. And there have been, you know, people that have noticed some changes, say, on, on the Ottawa River with, with certain... Uh, really once good fishing spots, no longer maybe so good anymore, it seems because they kind of lack vegetation and that may be a result of scouring that's occurred over the last few years uh, during some uh, un, un, uh, unusually high water periods. You have erosion as well, and erosion brings sediment into the rivers and lakes, and if that's allowed to settle out onto the bottom, you have changes in substrate. If that stuff is allowed to settle onto eggs, then we've got we may have a potential issue there uh, with, uh, with with asphyxiation of, of eggs as oxygen exchange can occur. At its best, it can flood important wetlands. So this year on Georgian Bay, we're seeing really high water levels on Georgian Bay. In the past, we were seeing really low water levels on Georgian, historically low. This year, we're starting to see historically high water levels, and this is actually maybe a good thing for muskies because. They uh, are, are able to access uh, historic spawning grounds and nursery habitats that once seemed to promote uh, a lot of reproduction uh, in that system. So it'll be interesting to see if this year uh, biologists can find lots of, of young of year. Uh, low water, at its worst, can prohibit access to spawning and nursery areas. So if you just don't have those wetlands flooded, then those fish can't get back up into those habitats that they really need to spawn in. Uh, the act actually, the very worst thing that we can see is for muskies is if muskies go up into the wetlands to spawn, and then we have like really low, very low precipitation uh, conditions that cause rapid decreases in, in the water levels, such that they end up exposing eggs. There's also something called the sash effect, and one of the Things that scientists are noting is an, is an increase in average wind speeds over the last period of time, several decades. And what this means for really big bodies of water like Georgian Bay is if you, if on Georgian Bay, you've got a strong east wind, right? So it's coming from like Toronto Barrie area and going uh, from east to west across the lake. You actually get a situation where you push a bunch of water away from that shoreline. So away from Severn Sound, Perry Sound, those areas in Georgian Bay where muskies want to spawn, that water pushes away from the shoreline. If muskies have already spawned, that water level drops really quickly. If it drops for long enough, those eggs will, will desiccate and they'll die. Okay, so that's, that's a potential problem. Uh, of course, at, lo at low water and uh, low water periods, at its best, it can potentially concentrate fish. So let's take a look at a Minnesota case study here. So ciscos are that species of cold water forage I was mentioning earlier. And the presence of ciscos have been linked to larger muskies. Okay, there's a, there's a link there. Ciscos are a really high energy food source. If we lose ciscos, we potentially lose 
uh, the right ingredients to create bigger muskies in, in certain systems. And what we've seen, what, what scientists have seen over time is a, uh, a decrease in, at least in Minnesota and, and, other, and other places as well, uh, a decrease in abundance of, uh, of Cisco over a period of time. So in this case, this one particular case study started noticing a decline in catch perina effort of Cisco around 1980. And if you look on those the, the left panel of graphs there, uh, there's uh, annual air temperatures have and water temperatures have gone up in both Southern and Northern Minnesota since about 1980. So there seems to be some association going on there. And the reason this is really critical for for Cisco's to have cold water is that they, they, they're just, they can't handle warm water and they have to have cold water refugia. And if they don't have that and much of the upper part of the water column is warm, then they're squeezed into this really narrow band of suitable water conditions for them. And, and that's, not, that's not good for them. We also see rain shifts and so it, with climate change. And, and so this is, this is a potential concern for a couple of reasons. First, if we get the movement of some species from the states extending into say, uh, into say lower Ontario, Southern Ontario, or say from the Southern states moving into the Midwest and upper Midwest, uh, though some of those species could become potential predators of juveniles and or eggs. So especially I'm thinking some of the sucker species that might not be found in great abundance in the upper Midwest or in, in Southern Ontario. Uh, and uh, you know some of these benthic these fish that feed on the bottom, if they're sucking up eggs, that may have a direct impact on egg mortality for muskies. We also see the range uh, shrinkages of some species, for example, Cisco, where, where once they were able to inhabit a particular body of water and no longer are they able to necessarily do that because the habitat conditions do not promote their survival. And so as we see in that graph there from uh, Van Zweden et al 2016, uh, under several different, I think it was 126 climate scenarios that they modeled, uh, the percent change in occurrence of Cisco's in Ontario water bodies declined in, in each of them, okay, in each of those scenarios. And they range from temperature increases of about one Celsius to around eight Celsius, which would be really extreme. So in summary, you know, again, I, I can't do this topic justice in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, in summary, I think, you know, we can expect to see more volatile weather conditions as we move forward. Uh, we've got prolonged periods of low water. Uh, that can be really bad for muskies. Um, and we, see, we may see extreme high water uh, that, and that actually harming habitat and potentially fishing as a result. Um, say you're scouring good, good spots and those spots no longer are able to hold fish anymore. Um, and we may see some changes to the cold water fish communities uh, like Cisco populations that 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 could put big muskies uh, at risk. So there's some, you know, there's some things that that are really not just the, you know, just uh, these things may happen. Right. So uh, I, I think we're going to start to see some things changing in the not too distant future, especially as we start to see vo really volatile weather conditions forming uh, over the years. So as always, um, if you've got any questions, feel free to email me or you can send them to John as well. And uh, I'll be happy to take some time out of my day and, and try and answer your, your inquiries. Fantastic, as always, um, Sean. And yeah, you know, this topic is a, this is a 90 minute topic right, right here to just go into to science discuss discussion conjecture and i guess i guess what people have seen and you know you talked about having conversations with old fishermen and i'm not an old fisherman but you know i'm, I'm getting a little bit there but i the difference between the river now and when i was a child um i, I tried to write down just a, a a few of the things and keep in mind people sean talked about very basic building blocks that are necessary um, to support a fish population. You know, the ability to reproduce successfully and have annual recruitment. And so when you play with the formula a little bit, you play with the formula a lot. And so um, riparian zone, that that area between um, 
between the water and the, where the water connects to the shoreline is so significant. And there's historical research in Wisconsin that shows if 50% of the riparian zone goes away, 50% of the big fish go away. And so if you look at all the development in Ontario, Quebec has really good laws in place about developing their shoreline. But um, since I was a kid, the number of houses built along the Ottawa River that all took cut down all the trees and put big rocks in place along the shoreline so they can have a good view. You know, that's what they're talking about when they mean destroying riparian zone that has fertilizer and runoff and silt going into the places that the fish need. So that's night and day. The islands on the river, um, I take pictures. I'm sure you're, you're an amazing photographer, Sean. Um, I've taken pictures since I was a kid and I take pictures of the, the islands each year when I see new erosion or the tree at the front of the mm -hmm. island, the big crested tree, you see it with every couple of years, the big tree falls down and then it erodes around it. The front of the island goes back a little more then the next tree goes down. And so, you know, I, I have sections where there were 200 trees when I was a kid and then there's 11 trees on a section I've been taking pictures of since then. So that's all what muskies need, you know, and that's, you know, it's erosion, climate change. How many days over 30 degrees since I was a kid? If you were young, if you're my age, how many degree, and, and you're a skeptic, how many degrees over 30 degree, degrees when we were kids? And the answer is this. And how many days now? And the answer is, is this. A lot. A lot. And yeah. so, you know, the weed structures on the river are night and day. I know an old guide from Montreal who came here and got shut out, pretty much shut out for a week. And commented, everything is different. I haven't been here in a decade, and it's all different. And the high, the high and low water levels that you talked about, um, with that, depending on how thick the ice is, we don't just get the water scrapes; we get the ice scrapes in the spring. So, when I was a kid in front of Orleans, um, in the '80s, was one of the greatest weed beds on the river. And my friends in West Virginia once found almost a hundred muskies in a week in this section and a lot of them were off of a lot of them were off of Betur's way there it is and go look at it on a map and if you go and look at that structure now there's almost no weeds on what was a two kilometer long center of the river weed bed that was filled with um mostly richardson's pond weed and um just a diversity of weed but richardson's pond weed which is a muskie's favorite weed. And that, that raw meat cabbage for, for that anyone. That has mostly disappeared that. and and coontail. And so, you know, the islands disappear. That's riparian zone. The weed beds disappear. That's what muskies love. The shoreline gets developed. And so the change happens year by year. You know, the death by a thousand, thousand cuts thing. Humans, humans yeah. hate change. We just, we hate change. We fight change on every level. But, you know, it's here. And... Um, and and, last and the, the likelihood, too, that one bad year is not going to spell disaster for a muskie population or a fish population. But as you just said there, that old saying, death, a death by a death by a thousand cuts. You know, that's that's what we're that's what we're looking at. That It's like change layered on change layered on another thing changing and another thing changing and this and that and this and that i mean even this year on georgian bay even if they have access to uh to high quality spawning and nursery habitat in these wetlands that that have been dry for many years leading up until now uh there's still no guarantee that that they're going to be successful in spawning there. You know, you may have lost individuals that ha had been able to imprint to those areas. And so you may not have fish that just make it into those same wetlands anymore or something else that we don't really know about has changed within that wetland that, that isn't promoting survival. So, you know, even if we do have good years like this, it still might not be enough, but then again, it might be great. And then, you know, the next several years are bad. And so you've got like one strong year class of fish that sustains a fishery for a while. And I mean, we could go on and on and on about this, but it, it really is like these very incremental changes that occur over a period of time uh, that end up leading to change. Yeah. Um, 
Huge, huge topic. Um, I got to say one thing to, to close it out, and then I'm going to get you to tell a Wally Robbins story just yeah. before we, we send you yeah. away, because I just realized there was a real good one. You know, uh, when I was in the shower before the show tonight. But um, again, in in a in a in an age where you need to get source information on climate change, I'm I'm really one of my smartest the smartest people I know is Elliot Berman, who's a professor at UC San Diego. He's one of my one of my good friends, uh, former head of the economics department, uh, noted author. I, I toured the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in California, which is where the birth of the climate change theory um, came from. And one of the most unfortunate things that ever happened was an inconvenient truth. And I love that movie and everything about it. And most of, although it's controversial, it's so controversial, most of what's said in that, if you listen to it going forward, has come true. The unfortunate thing is that somebody with a political tie gave really good science to the world. And the moment that someone with a political tie spoke that truth half the world was never going to listen to that truth no matter what because the truth the science back based truth was spoken with a political tinge and um and that is one of the saddest things and in my boat every year for many years i love americans i have so many great american friends including my new one sean land you know Doc, dr sean sean landsman but politics is a topic that i learned to just listen to in my boat for so, so many years, because there is no middle ground. You're either with them or you're against them. There isn't even the tolerance to listen or the possibility to change. And so that tying of knowledge to science is so unfortunate. And so to young people who don't buy science change uh, for political reasons, I'll say this, if, a few questions. When are the last five hottest years in the world? Look that up. When are the last 10 hottest years in the world? When are the last 20 hottest years in the world? And you can argue against climate change all you want, and we can't change your mind. But to you young people, look ahead. And in the next five years, score when the next five hottest years in the world are, and the five years after that, and the five years after that. And when the ice shield melts in the north and it's all gone, is it going to be real? Because it's there. It is. And it's, it's your choice. You know, everybody's got their choice. And I catch muskies with great people who believe and who don't know. But um, just a topic dear to my heart. And I'm sorry for that <laughs> that ramble. But I needed to get that out. So great topic choice for today, Sean. And let's go on to some serious musky yeah. stuff you where did you meet wally robbins tell this musky story so yeah we'll transition to something a little more uh light spirited i suppose i met wally in i think it was 2009 when we fished together and uh, or or 2010 I, I don't remember the exact year but we we got out for a fish on the Rideau river and uh i'd, I'd been you know, chatting a little bit with with Wally over over email, and we finally were able to to connect. It was in November. It was cold as heck. I got out on the river, and uh, I I hadn't been doing particularly well on the on the Rito, uh in that late in the season. And Wally's like, just watch and learn. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, I'm I'm I guess I'm going to school today on this boat. So uh, if Wally wants to talk about how he caught these fish that day, I'll let him do that. Um, we ended up catching three. Uh, we, Wally, caught three. I just played net guy. Uh, and one of them was a 47-incher that was probably over 30. If it wasn't, if it, if, if it, if it wasn't 30 pounds, then it would have been like, oh, it would have been over 30 pounds. It for sure was a really big fish. Um, if it wasn't 30, maybe it was high 20s, but I really think it was over 30. Another fish that was around 45 inches that was almost just as big. And then one, I think it was low 40 incher that was just fat as heck too. And uh, yeah, all told, I think we probably had around 80 pounds of muskies uh, that day. Uh, and I was just blown away just to look in the front of the boat at, uh, at Wally when he would grunt and say, there's one, reel down and set the hook like Kevin Van Dam. And if... You don't know who Kevin Van Dam is. You don't know what a Kevin Van Dam hook set looks like. Google it. 
Look that up on YouTube. That guy is, yeah, there you go. John's got it. I look up and would see Wally just reefing back on his rod. And it was, uh, it was a sight to behold, especially when that rod doubled over and then stayed doubled over. So it was all hands on deck. But yeah, that was, uh, that was my introduction to Wally. It was a super enjoyable day. He's a fellow Bears fan. What can I say? He's, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's awesome. And with yeah. that, we should we should bring Wally out. But, you know, this is the only part of the show I didn't have a good way to transition into. It. So I'm going to ramble for two minutes and we'll bring Wally out from there. Um, fantastic as usual, Sean. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks as always. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see you again. All the best. Um, before we bring special guest Wally Robbins out, Chief Technical Officer for the uh, Musky Factory Bait Company, Wally Robbins. Before we bring him out, uh, I'm just going to read a quote from one of his articles um, called The Guide Life. And it's, during any given week, a guide dons many hats from teacher, marketing and sales rep, photographer, storyteller, comedian, counselor, naturalist and historian, bookkeeper, public speaker, meteorologist, writer, travel advisor, an entertainer and so um you know it's I, I, it's it's like anybody who run who's an entrepreneur and runs a business um and and i've run a few different ones in the musky world just just amplifies that so um great writing as part of uh a, a part of a, a repertoire of great articles all uh wally and i thought i would add a couple comments to all those nice things that Wally said about the skill set of musky guides. Musky guides, all the good ones are a little bit weird. That's something else that you should know. They're eccentrics, they're characters, they're the they're just too caught up in this fish sometimes. You know, um, it takes a special person with a diverse skill set to be a truly great musky guide. And um I, I've worked with a, a bunch of guides, a lot of guides over the years. I've fished with a lot of guides in Canada, um, the U.S., Mexico, in places like Ethiopia, the Cari Canary Islands, and Phuket, um, like Wally. And so um, I really do know what it takes to, to be a good guide. Uh, I, I think I do. And th I'm, that's why I brag about my team all the time. And that's why uh, Mike and Lisa have been on a bunch lately and why... Mike is on tonight. Um, just can't say enough about them. Um, Mike, an absolute sponge, just completely devoted to learning and teaching. And teaching is a lot of what being a, a good guide is about. And so Mike's a natural teacher. Ironically, Mike Spratt's a teacher. Anthony Sapiano, good guide, good teacher. Um, and my wife is also a teacher. So uh, big part of guiding. We should get Wally out here, and then we're going to watch uh, a, a Lisa Goodyear video. Um, Wally Robbins has been my friend for a long time. He's been a life coach. He's somebody who, no matter where I set the bar, he always sets the bar higher, and we always need that person in our life. Whether we like it or not, it it, it just makes you a better person, and I'm a better person because of Wally. Uh, he's a renowned author with his words in In Fisherman, Outdoor Canada Magazine, Ontario Out of Doors, um, perennially in Just Fishing. He's written so many musky articles. An environmentalist who's dedicated countless hours to building four, um, 400 nesting sites on a local lake. Um, um, just uh, amazing all around. Um, the first time he's the most prepared person I know, which is why he's successful in musky fishing. We'll talk about that. The first time Wally arrived at my house for a charter, he was an hour and 20 minutes early. And I was I was so thrown off because that's the most early anyone's ever arrived. And I was pissed off because I had big plans for 78 of those 80 minutes that Wally just showed up because that's what a guide has to do before really being ready to go out and fish for the day. And um, we've been great friends ever since mike kadura we're gonna bring him out right now too um fifth year guide thirst for knowledge natural teacher um i've watched mike grow as a guide he's better every year um he works so hard to be a good guide and his success rate i didn't calculate it but i'm a good numbers guy and i want to say on 
like 45 outings, a bunch of them half days, almost 90% last year. As good as anybody I know as a guide or a personal fisherman up and down the river. So I uh, can't wait to hear your perspective tonight. Mike, let's bring those two out. Wow. Hey. That's, the, that's the most nice things I'm ever going to say in a row about both of you, just so you know. I yeah, know I point. I was flabbergasted that everything you said was nice. That's not the way that we <laughs> tend to operate most of the time. No, uh, I know. We have team ne we all have team negativity t-shirts. Mine has right. mine has captain on it, and that's when we just go out and fish and bitch at the world and that's a good day, man. I have to clarify something that Sean said. <clears throat> Sean said that I'm a Bears fan. I am not a Bears fan. Being a Bears fan is like being nibbled to death by a duck. <laughs> so, no, yeah. I'm not a Bears fan. It's sort of like being a Leafs fan, is that right? Mm -hmm. oh. uh, Send your in the past, In the past, yes. The times they are changing. Yeah, yeah, I think this year might be the year. I don't know. That's what Leafs fans think every <sighs> year, but you know, who knows? Who knows? How you doing, Mike? Hey, I'm great. I'm just enjoying all this. I was thinking Sean looks like more like a Detroit Lions fan with that big Lions mane he's sporting. I'm gonna try to convert him. Lions fan. That's another tough living being a Lions fan, but wow. <laughs> well, Always we'll talk. We're going to talk football um, in a minute. We're going to watch uh, just a quick video that Lisa did for us um, earlier today. Uh, a lot of first of all, what do you need to be a guide? And my sarcastic answer these days is you need five pictures of yourself holding a muskie and a Facebook page, and you're a guide. And there are guides. You know, everybody's a muskie guide. I meet a whole bunch of new muskie guides every year. Um, a lot of people want to be musky guides, and they're interlopers in the musky guide world because in the true, it's not what they thought it was. It's not nearly as glamorous, and it's just 10 times more the amount of work and commitment than they imagined, um, you know, and headaches and less money and just a whole lot of different things. So we're we're gonna we'll talk about a, 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 a guide. Um, Lisa Goodyear is one of the most qualified guides in the Ottawa area. She's one of only three people I know um, in the guide industry with a small vessel operator's permit in this area. And Lisa's gonna tell us what kind of training she did as part of learning to be a guide. And then we'll talk about when John and I first started having conversations about me becoming a guide for the factory. Uh, one of the first things I did was start to look at, you know, what are the requirements? What's the training that I need in order to do the job? And uh, I very quickly learned there's different classes of water in Canada from, you know, sheltered waters to near coastal class one, class two, and then offshore uh, classifications. And there's different um, courses and um, certifications for each level. Uh, right away, I knew I wanted to go kind of one step above, so I went to the SVOP, which is the Small Vessel of Operator Proficiency, which gives me the ability to guide in sheltered waters and near coastal class uh, two waters as well. So the course was incredibly interesting. Uh, I had to go all the way to Nova Scotia to the Nautical Institute at the Community College to do it, and I'm so glad I did because it's a world-class um, facility they have there, some really cool hands-on training um, exercises and equipment that they have like they really put you through it and it was an incredible experience so I just wanted to quickly kind of tell you about that and why I made the decision to go so first and foremost we obviously we covered a ton of material around safety we did the uh, DBS or um, domestic vessel safety course under marine emergency duties and I'll actually share some pictures with you that I have right now I'll forewarn you that uh, orange is not my color it's not the most flattering picture but I'll share it with you because it's it's fun uh, getting into these suits is quite the ordeal and the thing was they actually made us do it in the pitch black to simulate a real life emergency situation and what that would be like and uh, it was it was quite the eye-opening experience I will tell you for sure we also got to deploy a life uh, raft into a pool and ours actually uh, 
didn't inflate the right way up. It was upside down. And so we actually had to work together as a group in those suits and get that thing flipped over and get inside. And I'm a little claustrophobic. It was intense. And it really made me think like, wow, what this would be like in an actual real life situation in waves, in the weather, uh, on the ocean or on the, on the big water. Uh, yeah, it really made me think. And I hope I don't ever have to use uh, those skills that I learned for sure. We also went through some pretty intensive firefighting training, which was very cool. I love the hands-on stuff. Hey, who doesn't like to play with fire, right? Uh, there you go. I actually managed to get the fire out. And even little things like actually getting to deploy a flare, you know, you don't think about it. But in, in the moment, if you've already had that practice or that experience, it definitely puts you in a better, uh, better situation, that's for sure. Uh, last but not least for pictures, one of the things that I had no idea was so um, in depth was just the ability to read a nautical map if you don't have your electronics. You know, stuff happens, things fail, and if you're out uh, in the middle of a body of water, you need to have the skills to read a map to, to get back. And so that was a really great training, great experience uh, for me as well. A lot of people, and for me included, I had no idea what goes into being... Um, a commercially registered vessel and running a business as a guide, you know, right from commercial registration of the boat, commercial insurance, there is a ton of regulations and requirements that we, we must meet and we have to have everything documented. There's daily, weekly, monthly, annual checks, uh, training uh, that we are required to have proof of. And yeah, it's, it is a lot, it is intense. And honestly, after you spent 12 hours on the water every day, you know, you, you, you're still filling out your logs and you're still making sure all your safety gear is up to par and it's it's a lot, but it's worth it. It's, it's there for a reason. The rules and regulations are there for a reason. Unfortunately, people in Ontario, even in the last couple of years, I've heard uh, situations of people going out fishing uh, with a guide and, 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 and losing their life. And of course, really, that is something that I personally could never live with. That's why I wanted to put myself in the best situation possible to uh, take care of any situation that may come up on the water in it, because it, it does, can and will happen. Uh, I think John's got a story he wants to tell you afterwards. But the one thing that I want you to take away from today is one simple piece of information that will really um, help you make, maybe make you think a little bit about some of the safety equipment that you have on board your vessel. So when, I, when people ask, you know, do you have any life jackets? Oh yeah, sure, no problem here. I got my life jacket ready to go. But this is actually a PFD, a personal flotation device. There are a couple of different styles. They have their place for sure. They're great to wear while you're fishing. Uh, my personal favorite is the style here uh, that self deploys and they're a lot easier to wear while you're casting. Once again, PFD, the difference between a PFD and a life jacket is that uh, a life jacket is self riding. So if you fall into the water uh, unconscious, uh, wearing a uh, PFD, unfortunately, in most cases that really will not help you that much. But if you are wearing a life jacket, it actually will uh, self write you. It'll keep your head up above the water um, while you're waiting uh, to be rescued. So these are what we carry in our vessels. We are commercially registered, commercially insured, as I mentioned, and we require to carry 10% more than capacity. And as you can see, these things take up a lot of room in the boat. We have two sizes, one for kids, one for adults. But uh, it is a really great piece of equipment, and I think more people, even not commercially registered, should consider uh, carrying something like this in the boat. You can actually now get a, a more wearable, what I would call wearable style. They're quite expensive. I think they run about three or 400 bucks each, um, but they have that piece at the back that uh, will self right you if you fall in the water and could save your life, and you can't really put a price on that. Back to John, Mike, and Wally. Fantastic, Lisa. Thanks very much. Appreciate you prepping that video. I like videos because it's the first time in 17 sessions that I've I've got to leave my seat because <laughs> my, my Hamilton Muskies Canada chapter um, mug was empty and that's like a first time too. So I don't know. I don't know. So yeah, um, it turns out you actually do need some certifications. Um, Lisa is one of the most qualified. Mike and I updated our... Uh, our marine first aid course as of last year um you know fully insured with two million dollars of insurance have all the first aid equipment and life jackets and it seems like overkill until you need it but you know we fish october we fish november 
we fish December and there's guys who fish January. And so, you know, that equipment, um, um, I've actually rescued someone out of cold water, not related to a musky trip. And, and, you know, got my lifeguard certification at 16 and one minute in the water, one minute in the water and the person wasn't able to think right anymore. And it was just a, a lesson I learned, um, early in life um, and a tough and a tough rescue that all went well so plan for the worst um, make sure that your guides are certified that they are trained for first aid um, you know there's some some things that have happened even around Ottawa in the last few years um, with guides and with the weather it's just what we deal with so you know you want a guide that's prepared Lisa's the most prepared Mike and I are pretty prepared so we should talk about guides and guiding with two guys who really yes. know. And our uh, my format for tonight was to uh, to ask a list of intelligently crafted questions to get two different perspectives from the from the guest, um, the ultimate guest, and from from uh, a five star uh, a five star guide. And so, um, Wally, somebody who's fished with a ton of guides. For a ton of species in a in a ton of different places. Um, preparation, you're the most prepared guy I know. And preparation leads to success, especially in musky fishing. How do you prepare for a trip? Like the day before, you know, the day before, the week before, the month before. What do you what are you doing? Um <clears throat> Well, as you know, John, I'm kind of a long range planner at, uh, at heart. Uh, I think you have used the word anal a couple of times uh, about the way I approach uh, setting up a charter with a guide. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, I tend, to, uh, I tend to book with a guide a long time in advance. And I'll be very candid. The only guides that I want to fish with are guides who are really good at their craft and good guides whether they are guiding for redfish or snook or muskies or gar tend to be booked a long time in advance uh there is a guide who i fish with on lake of the woods uh spectacular guide he is booked a year in advance so my planning will often start a year in advance. And one of the first things that I do when contacting a guide is, especially if it's someone I don't know, is to give them as much information as I possibly can to do two things. Make their life easier and make the trip for me more successful or at least increase the odds. So I'm going to share with the guide uh, my experience, what I think I'm good at, stuff that I'm not as good at as I would like to be. I like to share with the guide the objectives I have for the charter, what I would like to accomplish. Uh, and I like to give a guide lots of lead time notice. So, if, say, for example, I want to get better at fishing crankbaits, I want to give the guide lots of lead time so that the guide can structure a day for me that involves a lot of crankbait fishing, which is basically what I want to achieve. That's that example. That's my return on investment uh, if, if, uh, if I'm hiring a guide. OK, In many cases, if I hire a guide, what's secondary to me is catching a fish because I love to learn new tactics. I love fishing new water. I like hearing different points of view. I like experimenting. And let's face it, if you want to learn to fish a particular type of bait that you're not particularly good at, uh, if that's the objective, for me, catching a fish, it's secondary. It's nice. It's a bonus. But my goal is to learn how to fish that particular bait. Wow. Um, you said a, a, a whole bunch of key words in that. Um, you know, clarity, 
in terms of what you want and not, you know, the fish being of secondary importance to you. Um, that's huge. And that's different than a lot of people and a lot of younger people. And it's really important for a guide to understand what their guest wants out of a day. And, you know, oh, I just want a lot of fish and I want a lot of big ones. And, you know, that's not the answer for uh, an awful lot of people. And you just gave a, a great answer on that. And so, Mike, what are you, what are you doing to prep for your uh, well, trip with your guests? That, that's a great first question. And now what I'll say is I try to remember when, when I'm taking somebody out, for me, it might be my seventh day on the water straight, but for them, they may have been looking forward to this for a whole year. So I need to make sure that I'm prepared mentally, like being enthused about it. And that's really a big key. When they first see me, you know, and they step out, they're going to get that first impression. And so one of the, one of the things I always keep in mind is for this person, this day on the water is something they've been looking forward to for a long time. Then of course, beyond that, you know, after, after making sure that, that I look as happy and enthused to get out there, which I am as they are, because we're going to have a special day. Uh, I always make sure that all the equipment is right. Everything is there. You know, John, you called me Mr. Thorough one time. Rods got to be checked. Lines have to be checked. Lures have to be sharp. Do we got gas in the boat? Are the batteries full? Is everything working? What was the fishing like, like last week? What was the fishing like yesterday? What's the weather conditions going to be like today? What are you thinking? What did you see? So it's gathering information and planning and thinking and gathering information and planning and thinking, keeping that enthusiasm. And then I guess finally for me, you know, a big part of it is, is it, is it how are they, um, what, is, what do they really want when they get on the water, as you said, you know, and finding that out first, you know, what did they want to get out of that day? And, uh, and you know, it goes on and on from there, but it's a, it's a, it's a long time. It's like they're thinking about it months ahead of time. I'm contacting them months ahead of time. I'm going to let them know a month out. This is what's been going on a couple weeks out. How's everything going the day before any questions? You got my phone number. You know how that goes, right? Make sure that they feel like they're taken care of. You don't want them coming there with a lot of questions. Um, I feel as well that like the relationship between a guide and the client can be one of the coolest relationships that can happen in fishing. And both parties have responsibilities. And sometimes I think, in fact, I believe that a lot of customers place far too many responsibilities for a successful day on the guide. I'm a firm believer that the customer or the client has really important responsibilities. And one of which is to be brutally honest with your guide about your competence and your abilities and your skills. Uh, the musky fishing is kind of a crazy, unique part of the fishing world. And uh, yeah, you might have 20 years experience fishing, but if you're, let's say, a walleye fanatic, and the majority of your fishing uh, involves finesse tactics. Like, you know, you dig out the slip bobbers and you're using eighth ounce jigs or Ned rigs. Yeah, you've got 20 years of fishing experience, but you are an absolute rookie when it comes to musky fishing. So be brutally honest with your guide. Let them know what you are competent with, what you're able to do and things that you that you have no experience with throwing three quarter or one pound baits for example <laughs> yeah yeah casting technique is a, a big part of teaching and in in terms of that advanced preparation one thing we try to do is vet our guests um really well to find out you know what they want not only what they want but their experience level um where they fish, when the last time they fished was, are they out in a in a in a uh, in a in a boat often? And um, you know, if if a guest just wants, if, if the trip is all about a fish picture, them holding a picture of a big fish, then it's actually easier to let your guide troll you up a big fish than it is to go out and teach you to cast for a fish. 
Uh, I want my guests to have that casting experience. I want them to have five or six contacts with muskies in a day. For me, that seeing the fish around the boat, you know, whether you catch that or not, just seeing that has such a, you know, such a big reward. And, you know, catching that fish is so much different than, than taking a rod out of a rod holder and reeling it in. But if it's about the picture, then, you know, then I'm going to go catch that fish because you're new casting and we're going to cast and do some learning that way. But the odds of you turning a fish in a circle three times at the side of the boat, the two <laughs> chances that you get on that in the day, I can't teach you that today. You know, as a guide, that's my goal is to teach you how to catch that fish. That's what I really, really want for you. You know, but if it's the picture you want, well, there's a lot more things we can do to put the odds in. Um, the brutal honesty, Wally, I, I love that comment. I, I, you know, in vetting our people, we, we make sure that musky fishing is right for them because lots of other people tell us, you know, there's so many people coming to musky fishing and you get calls from all types. And um, so, you know, you realize that we're fishing really hard for one fish today. There's three of you. We're going to have five or six chances today. You know, it's three people, six or seven chances. Statistically, we're going to fish for, you know, 1.7 fish in the boat statistically those are huge numbers in the musky world and we've got way bigger than average fish but those numbers sound stupid to a lot of people so is a musky the right fish for you on uh, for the the right fish for you to be out with to begin with and then you know we don't sell blue skies and sunshine we book every day there's a the thunderstorm three times a week in ottawa imagine if we just went out on sunny days to fish for muskies and so we don't book high activity days we book days in advance and we don't go and fish if safety is of a concern or if we think that there's not a reasonable chance of catching a fish you know there's lots of low activity days and we just we go through them and we have a really good success rate but making that clear to people we don't we're not selling you a muskie we're not selling you a guaranteed fish there's almost nobody who's an experienced muskie guide who guarantees musky there's some new guys who do but you know we take a lot of people back i'm so proud of my guides because we love our guests so much that there's a lot of a lot of go backs and just fin it fix it on an evening you can get a sunset in and squeeze that in later you know we can fix that but we're not selling fish and the other thing i should say to people when you're hiring a guide in the musky world is we're not selling spots we're not teaching you spots because you know we've been out for a thousand charters and if if you think about this from a guest perspective, if everybody came back to the spots that we were taking you to, that you caught your muskie on, there'd be a thousand people there. And that spot would have died a long, long time ago. So, you know, it's, it's a, a really interesting conversation to have with people. And the older you get, the uh, more frank you get in life, Wally. I think you'll, I think you'll agree on it. The more you just tell it the way that, the way that it is. And, um, you know, I don't own the river and I don't own the spots and you're certainly welcome to come back and fish. But if you come back and camp on the places that we take you to and the next person that I do does and the person after that, how many muskies do you think there are? Because not like there's more muskies come off of the spot. It's just dividing the muskies by the amount of people. And so what you teach, what we really concentrate on is teaching transferable knowledge and Absolutely. the muskies. You know, transferable knowledge that you can take anywhere from Renfrew down to down to Montreal. That knowledge works anywhere on this system or on any other body of water. And here's another secret that people don't really get is the muskies are pretty evenly distributed around Ottawa. The lower section of the Ottawa from the Parliament buildings on down, 110 kilometers, they're actually evenly distributed between the Parliament buildings and Hawkesbury, and I live in the middle section, but if I could spend more time fishing downtown, honest to God, that's where I would be. And I already spend, I already spend a lot of time around Hawkesbury. And I do, yeah, Mikey's pointing to his biggest fish behind him, downtown, you know, and it's because people go where there's pictures or where the guides are or whatever, but in truth, the fish are evenly divided. And so if you're a spot fisherman, it'll carry you this far. 
until that everybody else uses the spot like you are but if you learn behavior and how to go out and hunt you know the arm if in truth the arn prior section and the constance bay people are my two favorite areas to be on the ottawa river and it's better looking water it's beautiful muskies and if i was starting over i'd be there because you know for some different reasons but you know just something i wanted to get in about transferable knowledge and i for, talked right past nathan's comments yeah um, for was, me the single greatest value that a customer can get from fishing with an excellent guide and particularly an excellent musky guide is the transferable knowledge because you can go a full day and not even see a fish but still come away with valuable information that you can use for 20 years two of my all-time favorite days uh hiring musky guides we never caught a fish on either day one day was with mark thorpe 15 years ago mark was at that time mr musky in canada we never saw a fish i caught a pike it might have gone five pounds maybe five pounds the value that i received from spending seven hours in the boat with mark just you can't i can't put a price tag on it i use i still today use some of the information that mark shared with me when i fish now another day where we saw two fish but never caught one was with uh some guy named pizer Gord Pizer, who people tell me, have, you know, he's a good guy. The, he's, he's caught the good, occasion. He's a pretty good, he's a pretty good guy. Occasional you know, musk. You know, but, uh, you know, eight hours with Gord, first time I'd ever met him. Uh, I will never forget that day. We saw two fish, and they were basically 42, 43 inch teenage punk muskies. But, uh when i made the comment before that catching a fish to me sometimes not always but sometimes is secondary that's kind of what i mean you can have a, a dry net day and learn a ton and get more value for your dollar i want people to leave the day and i always want to hear them say they had a they had a wonderful day on the water they really enjoyed themselves and they learned a hell of a lot if exactly. they tell me that then i know i'm everything is good and and i'm i'm ha very very humbled to say that that is that is that i can't remember the last time i didn't hear that from somebody yeah. mike we learned a lot and man, we had a good time. Cause yeah, ninety percent is pretty good. I don't know if John's exaggerating a little, bit, maybe a percent or two there. Yeah, not ninety. It's, it's, it's in the mid eighties, I it's, think. It's, if a, I it's in the mid eighties. It is. It I was a heck of a year last that's year. That's fabulous, yeah. man. That's fabulous. That those, those are those are unbelievable numbers. You know. But if they the, tell in, well, in and I look who I'm with. Look who I'm with. I'm I'm with John Anderson all the time. I mean, come on, you know, I'm with John. I'm with Lisa. Me and Lisa were together. We're always talking about this. So, but really, if they if they leave the water and they said I had, I had a great time and we didn't get a fish and they said and I learned so much if they say that check the box that was a great day in the water and Absolutely. of course being safe so yeah glad you're saying that yeah I was thinking about this topic over the last couple of days and <clears throat> something occurred to me that surprisingly I hadn't thought of before we often talk about people fishing with a, musk, a musky guide and learning a lot. And that almost assumes that a lot of people who fish with musky guides are relatively new to the sport. And probably many are. What a tremendous way to learn. But there is huge value for an experienced angler, like a competent, experienced angler, to fish with a guide every now and again. Because I'll, I'll tell you a John story about this, uh, but even getting affirmation 
that what you are doing and how you are approaching muskies uh, is bang on the money. If, if you get that affirmation from somebody who makes their living fishing muskies and is on the water a hundred days a year, for me, that's really valuable. Now, here's the, here's the John story. And, and this was, <clears throat> I'm scared. No, you shouldn't be. And this is surprisingly a compliment. You said all sorts of nice things about me. I feel obligated to return the favor. Uh, first of all, John and I have fished together countless times. I, I probably have booked over 60 charters with John since I met him. I have a bit of a reputation uh, when I go musky fishing. I bring the worst possible conditions with me 90% of the time. If it's in the fall, yeah, wind gusts up to 50, that's the norm for me. And if it's in the summer, it's a high sky, the closest cloud is over Saskatchewan and the barometer is like 300. Uh, three or four years ago, I booked three days with John in July, brought those conditions and fishing was really tough. I remember we were fishing a long weed line I was throwing blades, nothing was happening. There were no birds in the air. There were no minnows in the water. There was nothing. And John gave me some feedback on what I was doing. And what I was doing was I was robo casting. I call it robo casting. Throw out the blades, bring them back in. Throw out the blades, bring them back in. Every retrieve that I was making was at exactly the same speed. And John brought it to my attention. Now, I should have known better because if you're doing the same thing time and time again and it's not working, change it up. But if I had been fishing by myself or with somebody who wasn't an experienced muskie angler, I would have spent the rest of the day robo casting i would love to end this story and say three casts later when i you know changed retrieve angles and speed i caught a 54 didn't happen didn't catch a fish that day didn't matter i got value i got feedback i was reminded you really have to pay attention and bring your a game especially when things are tough I just I want to answer a couple of the questions that came up, but I want to add a, just a disclaimer. When Wally says he doesn't catch a fish, um, Wally always sets the bar higher, and Wally pulls his lures away from anything under 45 inches long. So, you know, I admire you for doing that, and as a guide, I hate you at the same time, Wally. It's, <laughs> it's a real, you know, it, it's, it's tough. As someone who likes to catch muskies, Brent asked, is it true that when Wally Robbins shows up, there's a high percentage that a cold front is approaching. Actually, that's a little bit incorrect, Brent. Wally shows up the minute that the high front is just about peaking and stabilizing for the next three days. So yeah. that's exactly the kind of trip. Wally Blue Sky Robbins is a nickname. So we throw that's gold. We throw Arnprior Sunrise, which... <clears throat> You know, that's an interesting an interesting talk right there. How do you deal with blue skies? Wally is a voice of experience. He takes one lure, a Arn Prior Sunrise, all gold bucktail with a black and a gold, super reflective, and he throws it for three days in a row because he knows that that's the best odds bait. Now, nobody I know does that except for Wally. And he's right, because musky guys have ADD when it comes to lures a lot of the time. Or, you know, if it's not working, you got to change. But that's as good a choice as you can have. And in the end, you know, it pays off. So, John, you raised a really interesting point. And, and you're right. <clears throat> if I see a small fish, okay, <clears throat> uh, a quality fish, I use that expression, expression a lot. It's a very subjective uh, assessment. And, you know, for some people, a quality fish is a 48. For some people, any muskie is a quality fish. Everyone's right. 
my cut point is 45 inches. Uh, I really don't like to catch smaller fish than that for a whole bunch of reasons. One, I'm just educating that fish and I should be your best friend because if I pull away from a 44 and the next day you've got somebody in the boat who has never caught a muskie, I have showed you where that fish lives and what it was interested in. Uh, but I find the smaller muskies, if your bait has six hooks, I freaking guarantee you that that fish is going to have five of them and two of them are going to be buried. And by the time you've dealt with the fish in the net, cut the hooks, put on new hooks, you've just wasted 15 minutes on a, on a smaller fish. That for me doesn't work. For other people, absolutely. But I remember uh, when we were talking about, you know, picking guides, I think it's really important for anybody who hires a guide to assess where they are as a muskie angler. I go back to Bill Barber's four stages of a muskie angler. Stage one, catch your first muskie. Stage two, catch as many of these damn things as you can. Doesn't matter if they're 22 inches or 52 inches, just load them. Then this third stage is big fish. Big is relative based on where you're fishing. And then there's the fourth stage and I'm just entering that and that's looking for what Bill calls the fish. The one you really, really want. So if you're thinking about booking a charter, I think it's really important to not only be really selective about your guide, but about your water system as well. Because if you want to load muskies, I don't suggest going to the St. Lawrence or Georgian Bay or the northwestern part of Lake of the Woods. And if you're looking for your first muskie, don't go there. You know, go to a place like the Rideau River where it's a little easier to catch a muskie or go to the Kawarthas. So the customers, coming back to customer responsibility, do everything you can to set yourself up for success. Don't expect the guide on uh, Georgian Bay to produce a five fish day for you. That's completely unrealistic. You're setting yourself up for a failure and you're sure not making friends with the guide. Yeah. Um, words of wisdom, Mike, I got it. I want to get a question, a couple questions to you. Lisa, sure. you had a couple questions on the screen um, and we talked right past them. There was a question on population on the heyday of the river. Was that right? You think, the, the, on, do I think the population numbers are as high on the upper Ottawa as on the lower? Um, hmm. You know, in truth, I think the population numbers are a little bit better on the lower section of the Ottawa. I don't get up to the upper, uh, to the, to the, to the Arnprior section as much anymore. Arnprior is the only town I know where people don't talk about 50 inch muskies. They talk about 60 inch muskies. It's the only place on the planet. It's weird that way. And they also don't, you know, they always go, no, no, we don't catch. It's tough here. We don't catch. Yeah. And the guys who tell you, <laughs> the guys who talk to you about their muskies like that go, yeah, okay. I used to listen to those and not go to those places. But the gray <laughs> hair, when you get to know this much gray hair, you know, you know. So, like I said, I, you know, Arn Prior to me is the, just a really beautiful, beautiful stretch of water. Uh, Conscience Bay, Fitzroy Harbor. I love that. That middle section in there, you know, Aylmer to... To Fitzroy, that's a that that's a little tougher section, but it's also got some <clears throat> some of the least pressured water on the Ottawa right in there in the islands and and, and around if you look at it. There's areas that the public doesn't go, so you know, and there's some crazy big fish have come out of there. So yeah, that's there you good. go. Heyday on the Ottawa River. Uh, Hedrick Wachelka next week. We'll ask Hedrick when the heyday yeah. on the Ottawa was. Best populations of all time. An interesting question that uh, I brought up at the symposium this past weekend. Mike, um, how do you maximize your guest efficiency out on the water? How do you coach them for endurance? How do you make sure that they're 
that they're there when the muskie um, when the musky shows up. Well, you know, how do you do that with your guests? What do you tell them at the start of the day? Well, well, that that's a great question. So I'm usually being that teaching thing. I I go with the idea that I in my head I want them to experience as much as they can about how you catch muskie. So there's going to be a combination of trolling and casting throughout the day, if at all possible, right? Like that's that's the goal. Um, some people come like I've I've had older people one time they wanted to cast I had them for two days and they wanted to cast they wanted to catch a 50 inch muskie casting, and frankly you could tell from the physical their 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 physique and their the shape that they were in um that they didn't really have a realistic expectation of what that was going to be like so you know i try to use with i remember with them i tried to use lighter baits easier baits that were easier to pull i used the lower gear reels you know um easier to bring in and so really watching and monitoring them making sure that i'm suggesting hydrating i'm suggesting eating um moving to if i notice they're getting a little more tired we may move spots a little more often so that so that they get a forced break while the boat is moving from one area to another so really reading your clients um non-verbally is a really important thing to do and then and then i want to save that energy and talk about i want to instruct them with the idea that you know at the end of the day when you're beat up and you're tired and you think there ain't no muskies in this river that that's when that fish is going to show up so you know coaching them to be aware to not lose their concentration watching for fatigue those are things that really are key in making that trip uh the, the ultimately successful not just learning and having a great time but you know like lisa has some really nice pictures she has the four uh the I had a four fish day, including a 50 last year on there. Well, this gentleman, right? So he's an older guy, pretty good. That was the first one that we got. Um, he ended up throwing bulldogs and he got that beautiful 50 inch fish on a suic. Uh, but he wanted to throw, he, we call him, he, we call him big dog. Now his partner behind him, Rod, Rod Hunt. He told him that that girl there, her dad, they went out and it was a father's day gift. They were coming from a long way off and they never, and man, I mean, look at the smile on their face. Right. But she couldn't fish the whole day and she purposely wanted to take some breaks, you know? So while she's taking breaks, what am I doing? And how am I trying to coach her to get back into wanting to make another cast? Cause that's what we're there for, you know, and making sure that dad is in the best place that he can be to get that fish. You know, there's a lot that goes into monitoring those people. This guy and his uncle, this young man never got a muskie before. Right. He had never caught one before. So when you get a young man like that, you look at him and you say, OK, he's right on the borderline of can he cast? Is he able to cast a musky rod? Do I have the right size musky rod? What kind of lures can I expect a, a younger tyke like him to be able to throw in the water and, and where he's going to have a legit tech? A chance to get a fish so maybe it's a maybe it's a smaller size top water maybe it's not the biggest top water we have maybe it's a little bit smaller one it would be easier for him to throw you know but i do want to get him a fish and i'm really happy that all three young people there's one more at least i think a young man uh, uh go beyond not him another guy i think there was yeah that his mom so it was him and his mother and they lived they're local they're from around here and and she wanted her son to catch a fish she didn't even want to fish she wanted her son to get a fish and man so i'm really looking at him going okay well you're right around that size of can you really handle this what lures am i going to be able to give you how am i going to be able to coach you up and keep you interested how am i going to keep mom happy about this while we're doing this because really that's my job wally had a great quote and i'll leave with this he had a great quote in one of his articles that I read, and I'm so thankful that he sent me those articles to read about that uh, as a guide, you're not going to meet the expectation. You're, you want to exceed the expectation of your clients. And I and I couldn't put it better. You know, I want that, that mother, I want her and that son, I want them sending me emails three weeks after. I want them talking about that day they had on that water and that guide that they had. You know, so really, how do I maximize them? There's a lot that goes into that, including reading them. There's a lot that goes into it. Reading them, what are their abilities? What, what do they look like? How do they look throughout the day? Again, health reasons, things that you're keeping in mind. There's a lot that goes into it, a lot. And you got to be subtle. You can't say to somebody, oh, I think you're getting a little fatigued. Why don't you try this one? You know, <laughs> that's not cool. People don't want to hear that, right? So. I'll stop there. We could go on and on, couldn't we? <laughs> what a what an incredible collection of kid photos. Those were all from last year, just yeah. for anyone who's watching. And there's a, and there's a bunch more. <clears throat> the neatest thing you said there was mother and son out fishing. And that's 
that's the new that's the new age it's not a testosterone driven sport anymore there were so many mothers and daughters um mothers and sons that Two were girls. out fishing grandmothers that were out chucking baits with us in the boat last year you know um and it's just the way that it is it was a surprise a while back it's not you know there's a lot of people finding musky fishing and um it's so neat that you get to teach them a reverence for the fish and proper handling and how to hold the fish for the photos and that whole experience you know and and how to release it you know the release the the hook out tool and there's things that you should learn on your own in life and there's things that you should let somebody more experienced teach you and handling a muskie isn't something you should learn on your own okay it's a lion it's rare you know it's really special it that balance if you didn't get it from sean that precarious balance of the apex predator and if you want to watch something really cool watch stephen cook's talk at the symposium this past weekend about the state of apex predators around the world and in general and all around us and our muskies are wild naturally reproducing and our populations are strong right now so you know every every little bit every piece of good handling teaching every child to be a good steward you know and that and and, and right from the beginning so important so you know i i get letters i said too many i get letters about mike every week i swear to god all summer long just time after time after time and so it's so nice so rewarding for all of us to be a part of that story and uh and the learning that's involved in that um if you had a thought you can spew it out wally or i'll go right back to um what drives you nuts about fishing about fishing guides that you've had then mike i'll ask you what drives you hmm. nuts about guests and uh We'll both come up with that. Yep. As from a customer point of view, and you did the article, Wally. You know, one of your articles was solely based on customer uh, uh, customer feedback, customer expectations, right? Yeah, I wrote a piece recently <clears throat> called nice point, tips, Billy Barber. For, tips for Guides. And it was a look at <clears throat> the guiding experience, but through the eyes of a customer. Uh, and it was a really, really fun, fun piece to uh, to write. Now, I think at last count, I've fished with 30 guides uh, in Canada and the U.S. Not all for muskies, uh, but uh, that's a pretty good cross-section. I would say that out of, oh, geez, 30 trips would total over 100 days easily. I have had two or three days that I would rate on a one to 10 scale as being an 11. I've had all sorts like sevens, eights and nines. And yeah, I've had a couple of days that the experience really sucked. And I'll give you two examples of things that really drive me nuts. Uh, about <clears throat> some guides. Number one, <clears throat> I fished with a guide one time who spent at minimum during an eight hour day, two hours on his phone. <clears throat> now, I completely understand the life of a guide. Sometimes the phone rings, it's a customer, you're trying to fit this person in, they've had to change dates. I have no problem with the guide taking that call. Uh, I mean, like that's you know, that's common sense. But this guy was chatting with buddies. He was talking about I don't know if it was the bears. It was probably the bears. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, I'm paying 550 bucks to fish with this guy. He just doesn't understand that he's in the service business. And for the time that I'm in his boat, it's all about me. It's not about him. I don't care if, he, if he's bombing in his NFL pool. You know, you're eating into my time. So that's one thing that drives me crazy. The other, and I won't name names, uh, 
fished with a guide. We ended up with an absolutely gorgeous 48 inch fish in really tough conditions. Absolutely beautiful water system. <clears throat> Sounds like a pretty cool day. On the one to 10 scale, I would give that day a two. Because <clears throat> this guy, who is a, he's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. He's an excellent angler. <clears throat> we show up at our first, at the first spot. He's out of the driver's seat, up on the front deck, plants himself directly in the middle of the front deck and made it perfectly clear, this is where I am. That was also where his electronics were. Now, the type of fishing that we were doing, it was target fishing. We were fishing shorelines. We were throwing at specific targets, big boulders, blowdowns, interns along the shoreline. <clears throat> Guess whose bait was going through first? Not mine. <clears throat> Gorgeous fish. He caught a beautiful 48-inch muskie that I netted. And at the end of the day, when I scratched him a check, what was going through my mind was this. I just paid $500 to net somebody else's fish. Zero value day. So those are two examples of things that drive me crazy. Uh, <clears throat> I have never fished with either one of those guides since. Never will. Will never recommend them. But they are both really good guys. Like they're good people. They don't understand that they are in the service business. They're not in the fishing business. They are in the service business. Wow. Um, really interesting uh Really interesting point because, you know, there's no guide school. I don't know any Canadian colleges that have the two-year guide diploma course. I checked. It wasn't at Algonquin. And so, again, you know, five pictures of you holding a muskie in a Facebook page, and some people are guides, and some people think because they can catch fish that that they can be guides. And, you know, it it, it is so much more than that. Um um, having good training so important. Um, we do a lot of training with Mike and Lisa and I. We fish as a pack, which is yeah. another really important thing. We're out seven days a week. And if we're not going out, you know, even when we are going out, because we're fishing different sections, we do everything we do to mitigate pressure. Um, you know, like not fish on our days off anywhere where we could spoil a fish that might that a guest might catch later on you know and i've had guides who just didn't get that you know most lodges i was lucky when i was a teenager i had lodge training i went to a place that had a lot of guides and they said this is what you do you show up at this time you get a shore lunch kit here's where you get assigned a guest here's where you meet a guest here's where you inventory everything in your boat now you're ready to go out for the day now go greet your guest you know and Wow, man, I like there was a, a, a you know, that was a a, a, a a really good base. But, you know, most lodges, you don't fish. If, if you're at a trophy lodge, you don't fish on water where the guests are going to catch trophy fish. And in musky fishing, you don't get to catch a fish over and over. And so, you know, my guests, my guides fish a lot. Like <laughs> Lisa and Mike on their days off. They go musky fishing because they're young and full of energy still. <laughs> but they don't go musky fishing anywhere where we're going to go. Right. They go learn new things. They go to a new area. They go and fish new spots in an area that they know, you know, and that's just just part of it. So, you know, the learning to fish as a pack, learning to fish, um, you know, that sharing of knowledge, that everything for the guest. Um, yeah, and as as guides, we in musky guides get to fish with our guests more than any other group of guides. And you just described how not to fish with your guest as a guide, Wally. In the story you just told, I have heard over and over and over, you know, from from people about I netted their fish, they fished the front of the boat, their bait was out in front, you know, and <clears throat> not a criticism of younger guides, but. Uh, Jimmy Sarek made the comment, and and wow, I should clarify this. We were talking about Spencer Berman 
and Mike Hulbert, two guys who produce the most fish of all. When you're young, fishing is all about getting the most fish in your boat, period. And it's not about the guests, just fish, fish, fish. And it's great to be out with somebody who's so hungry because they're going to find the fish. But honestly, when you're younger, um, and Spencer's one of the best guides everywhere. I do not mean any slight on him. And, you know, Mike, Mike's grown, grown too. But you learn that it's more about the guest and sometimes less fish is a better thing for yeah. your guest. You know, even if it's not on your Facebook page, it's a better thing for for your guests and for the experience. Um, Mike, what drives you nuts about guests okay, in your okay. boat? So it's really quick. One thing, and I got to get this out. Hi, mom. She's not a musky fisherman. I told her she's going to be watching the show. I told her mom, I'd say hi. Hi, mom. It's like John's mom. I, we all have that. Now the, I, I thought it. about this and they really think there's really one thing. And, and, and uh, I'd ask people to really think seriously about this. You know, the partying before you go musky fishing. Yeah. Okay. You do not party. <laughs> you do not imbibe. Okay, in any mind altering substances in any form before you go musky fishing. The worst scar I've ever seen on somebody's hand was trying to net a fish when he had been imbibing, you know, or trying to get a fish unhooked when he had been imbibing. And this fish got into his hand with the hook and everything. You know, you, you can't do that. The only in the five years plus now that I've been guiding, the only trip I ever but you know didn't go away feeling good about that was really the issue was that the guests had started celebrating before the celebration the celebration is after okay it's not before you go out and so that's a tricky one because how do you say that to people well you just i guess you just have to like you said earlier while at the beginning of the show you have to be brutally honest with them you have to let them know look that's for after when we're done, if, if that's what you want to do, that that's great. You know, you want to celebrate. That's great. We had a great experience, but not, not in the boat, not before you go out. That's a disaster. So that's my biggest complaint. Yeah. Don't I'll, want that I'll, I'll add to that. You know, I have guests. I mean, I used to fish a lot of split days, you know, and, and we still do. Sometimes you catch a giant fish in the morning and people show up later and you want it to celebrate. It's your trip. And if you're here, you know, it's your trip and it's whatever you want. I just not going casting with you if you've been drinking. Yeah, not throwing. We're throwing musky. You know, there's musky lures all around in the boat. It, it's it's bad things can happen. You know. Yep. Um, yep. And yeah, I'll, I'll I'll just leave it at that. Um, things that drive me the most nuts as a guide, um, uncoachable people, because you work so 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 hard to catch that fish. Um, and, and, you know, when you told them it was going to happen, you've coached them for hours on it and the hot fish shows up to eat the bait and you can see the fish wants in your boat so bad. The fish wants you to take a picture of it. And, you know, your guest, you, despite the fact you told them 11 times, didn't get it. Now, you know. I'm there to catch muskies. I'm not the young guy who's fishing for me, but I really, really want you to succeed. And it, it's it's like that guy with the slap chop, Vince, you know, you know, it's, we can't do this all day. So probably you should catch one of those fish that shows up at the side of the boat and do what we told you to do. Cause you know, and I tell them at the start of the day too, I set it up, you know, you're going to have odds are two of us, five to six chances and three of them will be at the side of the boat. And the people who are new, and then you train them for that moment. And so the first time a fish shows up, especially with new guests, you know, it's, wow, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't, I didn't see that. I wasn't looking, I wasn't looking there. And you know, that's good. That's good. That's one. Yeah. That's one. So you got three more of those. You know, we got another seven hours. It's good. We got that out of the way because. <laughs> That's that's how it works. And, and you know, it's not me going to catch the fish. It's you who's going to – the magic is going to happen with you. If you want me to catch the fish, and we do, as guides, you know, fishing, when it's later in the day when we need a fish, I ask guests, you know, does it help if we fish right now? If I catch a fish and hand it off, is that good? And the odds of your guide catching a fish, if you want to catch that fish 
casting or have that experience you know and just bring into the fish the the fish to the boat is a reward but um you know it's it's different so comes down to efficiency and and what your guest uh, what your guest wants the other thing i'll say that as a guide that drives me nuts is people that follow us around oh yeah and, and yeah. there's a there's a couple i'd actually like to say hi to because i know you're listening to everything that we say and you're still going to be in my effing bubbles next year and that's just just no class because you know our guests don't come back on the spots um for the most part people people that fish for this fish are so respectful of the fish and of nature and of other people and um you know that there there are there are some people that do that we don't own the water you're welcome to come back please do and i encourage you to do it but you know if you come in camp or you make a living following us around you know wow uh, that's just you're a thief you're just an you're just a thief so have some class musky fishing is a classy sport with so many good people uh so so many good people so just needed to get that out with calling out without calling anyone out in uh, in particular guys we have uh raced through our yes. our 90 minutes and somehow it's already like it's an hour and six minutes if i do math maybe i don't know i don't know an hour and six minutes so um wally you've been such a great teacher uh such a great friend and such a good influence in my life over the years um and we're not going to have you back on the show for the rest of 2020 uh, 20 so what, what do you have uh 2021 what do you what do you want to close with what do you have to say uh <clears throat> just a message to uh people who hire guides and especially musky guides musky fishing can be a bit of a roller coaster it's a sport that can really play with your head and as john says so often we spend a lot of time not catching fish. Um, sometimes, and I've had many days like this, it's harder to catch a decent muskie than it is to teach your toaster how to play chess. That's just muskie fishing. But if things are tough, don't blame the guide. Guides want you to catch fish. And good guides do everything in their power to make that happen. You're hiring a guide. You're not hiring God. No musky guide on earth can make fish bite. So <clears throat> I'm a real stickler for responsibilities in any kind of relationship. The customer guide uh, relationship is, in fact, that. So it's... I think it's important that customers understand what the guide is all about and that the guide understands what the customer is all about. And if there's clear communication about hopes and wishes and dreams and expectations on both parts, hiring a guide can be one of the coolest things that you can do and where you can learn the most in the shortest period of time. So that's how I want to close. That was a great close, Wally. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure to have you, my friend. You know, um, you were the most challenging guest to get on here. I'm so glad we finally did it. There's a story behind that. Thanks for being here, my friend. Mike Kadura, what do you want to say? Uh, I'm looking forward to fishing with Wally. And I'm looking forward to a whole nother year of fishing coming up pretty soon. And it's been great. And I thank you all, all of you guys. Like I said, I, I typed in earlier today, standing among giants here with you guys on the show. I mean, I learned so much from you all the time and uh, really, really looking forward to doing some more of that. So appreciate it. Thanks a lot, um, Mike, Wally. Um, great, great stuff. And I'll try and leave us with a two thoughts uh, uh, of wisdom. Um, some people think that fishing is about the fish it's not it's about the people and no fish exemplifies that more than muskies do because 
like I say all the time, um, we spend a lot of time not catching fish. So in the end, it's uh, it's all about the relationships. So when you go fishing, uh, go fishing with great people. Um, enjoy the experience. Revel in where you are because it's not about it's not about catching all time. Musky fishing is just one of the coolest pastimes for so many reasons. And if you don't get that now and you're young, you know, you'll learn to appreciate it when uh, your hair is the same color as two out of three of the people on here. Um, <laughs> or no, this time, or no and la Last thought is um, um, a comment that came earlier, uh, I think through Wally, just paraphrasing. Uh, going out with a guide, one, enjoy the experience. Have a great day. Um, what a good guide should do is teach you to catch more fish for the rest of your life, impart yeah. some knowledge on you, impart a reverence for the fish, um, leave you wiser, leave you happier. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight, episode 17. I'm really happy to be here. Peace, we'll see you all next week.